Hello everyone! As you can see, this is not a review of Godzilla Final Wars. I apologize for the delay, but the good news is that I went to the library today and got things straightened out, and it's now on its way to me, so tune in next week for that video. While I'm still waiting, I thought that I'd take the opportunity to review an Alfred Hitchcock movie. I haven't done one of those in a while. I feel like I can hear a small chorus of voices saying, yeah, we know. And I think it's time to talk about Vertigo, which I find to be a daunting task, but I'm up for a challenge. Vertigo has already been discussed every which way. Right here on YouTube, you can find videos discussing its use of perspective, colors, relationships, staging, videos analyzing the entire film, and individual scenes. Clearly, these are somewhat crowded waters that I'm wading through, so I'm not going to try to reinvent the wheel. I'm just going to do what I usually do, which is to share with you my own personal thoughts on the movie. Now, lots of you know I don't like to give away the whole plot when I'm talking about a movie, even if it's old. I have a lot of viewers who aren't so familiar with old movies, and for your sake, I don't want to ruin a movie's surprises before you get the chance to experience them for yourself. In this case, I can't avoid that. I will have to go into spoilers at some point, but I will give you a warning before I do, and then you can choose whether to stay or to skedaddle. Alright, let's go! Vertigo, directed by Alfred Hitchcock and starring James Stewart and Kim Novak, was released in 1958. Stewart plays ex-police detective John Scotty Ferguson, recently retired from the force after an incident in which he watched a colleague fall to his death and discovered he had an intense fear of heights. While still recovering, Scotty meets up with an old school friend who asks him to tail his wife Madeline, played by Kim Novak. He fears her sudden strange behavior and memory lapses indicate she's being influenced or possessed by a ghost. Scotty reluctantly takes the job, but as he follows Madeline around San Francisco, he finds himself falling in love with her, even as he questions her sanity. I could go on, but I think I'll stop there. Vertigo made huge waves in the film community a few years ago when Sight & Sound magazine, affiliated with the British Film Institute, voted it the best film of all time ousting Citizen Kane from its 50-plus year reign. The announcement was a surprise to Kane's fans and a victory for its haters, but it also showed how much things had changed since Vertigo's original release. It didn't do so well in 1958, certainly not as well as other Hitchcock movies of that period. But Vertigo seems to have come into its own now, and a lot of people have subscribed to the idea that it's one of the best films of all time. Whether you love it or not, whether you think it is deserving of that title or not, it's not hard to understand why it's held in such high esteem. The story is based on a French book, D'Entre les Morts. Uh, well, you can see the title for yourself and the author's names. I won't insult them by trying to pronounce them. I hear different accounts about how faithful an adaptation the movie is. Some say it's way off, some say it sticks surprisingly close. I don't know. <laughs> Vertigo is part detective story, part tragic romance, part ghost story, part psychological thriller. Those are all pretty heavy, and there's less humor or sass than you may find in other Hitchcock films, especially earlier ones. Not that it's all dark, there are moments of levity in the first act, but any lightness quickly evaporates as Scotty begins this downward spiral as he gets pulled into the mystery. Obsession is a big theme here. Obsession, desire, manipulation, voyeurism. Themes touched on in other Hitchcock movies, but only explored so thoroughly in this one. The movie has many twists and turns, including one in which Hitchcock abruptly changes perspective, letting the audience in on a character's secret and thereby introducing a new layer of tension in the final act. And Hitchcock wasn't afraid to leave some questions unanswered. Of course, one person's unanswered question is another person's inconsistency. But where the rules of the game are unclear, and the line between perception and reality is a little blurry, I think the need for cut-and-dry explanations is lessened. In other words, Hitchcock kind of provided an excuse in case every little detail doesn't add up. Vertigo is possibly Hitchcock's greatest artistic achievement. Everything comes together beautifully. The technical elements, the aesthetic elements. 
I have seen Vertigo several times since I was young, and we picked up this VHS tape right here. Um, of course, back then, I was too young to fully get it. Watching it again to do this review, I realized how few times I've actually seen it from the very beginning, and yet how important that opening is in setting the mood. Bernard Herrmann's music plus Saul Bass's mesmerizing main title design immediately captivates you. I cannot imagine Vertigo without this musical score. All of Herman's Hitchcock scores have memorable, vibrant themes, but Vertigo stands out. It covers so much emotional ground. It's dreamy, it's intense, it's passionate, it's foreboding. The instrumentation and composition is brilliant, and the various motifs distinct yet not overused. It's a great study in how to write for film, or at least how composers used to write for film. The movie also has some great special effects, features that were way ahead of their time and are still delightfully fresh. The hypnotic opening titles with the spinny spirograph design, the nightmare sequence with its bizarre and iconic imagery, the vertigo effect. For a long time I've been under the impression that this effect was one of the most famous examples of a dolly zoom, but I've also seen it referred to as a contra zoom or a zoom out and track in shot. But that's the same thing, right? Pushing the camera forward and zooming out at the same time to achieve a disorienting effect where the background seems to stretch. Whatever you want to call it, contra zoom, dolly effect, vertigo effect, zoom out and track in shot, it's a cool trick to illustrate what Scotty, the acrophobic, is seeing when he looks down from a great height. And it was a complicated and expensive effect to achieve because they had to make miniatures since they couldn't just suspend the camera on a dolly over a staircase. There's lots of fun stuff to learn about filmmaking from this movie if you ask the right how they do that questions. I'm just scratching the surface. There's some great costumes, too. For some reason, Jimmy Stewart's brown suit always sticks with me. I don't know why, it's not that special, but whenever someone mentions a man's brown suit, this is what I picture. And there's Kim Novak's entire wardrobe designed by Edith Head. The striking contrast of the black and white ensemble, the trim, well-tailored gray suit, they're exquisite outfits, and they're specially designed and photographed to be recognizable, even from a distance. There aren't a lot of characters in the movie. There are only four actors, I think, who appear in more than one scene, and two of them pull back into the shadows in the second half. Jimmy Stewart, what can I say, he's always good. Always convincing, always likable. Well, <laughs> he does turn a corner here. I love those climactic moments in his movies when his characters get pushed beyond their limit and go a little nuts. Stewart excelled at playing the regular, mild-mannered guy driven to a breaking point. But I've gotta admit, for me, this is one of his more difficult roles to watch. I find it troubling to see Jimmy Stewart acting this way, chasing phantoms, becoming desperate and controlling, destroying himself, destroying the object of his desire. As for Kim Novak, she is striking in this movie. Her naturally noteworthy features are further accentuated by the careful styling of her hair and makeup. It's no wonder Madeline leaves such an impression on Scotty. Hitchcock allegedly blamed much of the movie's mixed reception at the box office on Stewart, saying he was too old to play a romantic lead opposite a woman roughly 25 years his junior. And when you put it that way, yeah, it's a bit much. But I've never been distracted by that, besides noting with amusement that Stewart's hair is grayer in some shots than in others. To me, the age difference isn't so glaring. Stewart seems a little younger than his natural age, and Novak a little bit older. Not so much that it balances out, but I think it's viable, and Stewart and Novak sell the relationship. And if you like their chemistry here, I suggest you check out the other movie that they did together, a much lighter one released the same year, the fantasy comedy Bell, Book, and Candle, which also has a very good supporting cast. One bit of trivia about Vertigo that I find intriguing is that Hitchcock originally wanted Vera Miles to play the female lead. But while production was delayed, Miles married and got pregnant, which took her out of the running. From all accounts, Hitchcock was angry with Miles, who had appeared opposite Henry Fonda in 53's The Wrong Man, but it didn't keep him from working with her again two years later in Psycho. 
I really like Vera Miles. I enjoy her in those other Hitchcock movies and in the movies where she was paired with Jimmy Stewart, The FBI Story, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. So naturally, I do sometimes wonder what Vertigo might have been like if she was available. I'd also like to make a couple comments about Midge, one of the most pathetic characters in a Hitchcock movie played by Barbara Bel Geddes. Midge is Scotty's longtime friend and sometime confidant who clearly wishes she meant more to him than she does. It takes just two quick shots in her first scene for us to learn all we need to know about her relationship with Scotty. But if you were the one that called off the engagement, you remember? I'm still available. Available Ferguson. In a split second, we know that even though she jokes with him about their broken engagement, she still has feelings for him, and he has no idea. She plays it cool, even though sometimes it's painful, but she's determined to hold on to this friendship because that's the way to keep him in her life. And you feel that she's still hoping that maybe, someday, unfortunately, she's her own worst enemy. Every time the scene comes up where she's painted herself into the portrait of Carlotta, I'm just like, ugh, no, don't do it, I hate this. I wish she'd move on, read the signs, accept the fact that he's not into her and never will be, stop trying so hard, have some self-respect and learn to be happy. But I also feel incredibly sad for her. She's always struck a chord with me, and that's a layer of depth that adds a lot to the film in my opinion, even if she's one aspect film critics seldom talk about. Now for the tricky part, discussing how I feel about the movie. I know for a lot of people, Vertigo is their number one. That's not the case with me. Not that there's much I dislike. I do find the first act moves a little slow, and there's a lot of time spent riding around in Scotty's car, um, and the ending wraps up really fast. But obviously, as this review shows, I have a lot of praise for the movie. I like it. I like Vertigo. I appreciate it. I've voluntarily watched it multiple times. I enjoy it. There are just several other Hitchcock movies that I enjoy more. Would it be my choice for best film of all time? Probably not, but I don't know what I would choose. Um, most of my favorite movies aren't pretentious enough. I did see someone say once, best film of all time? It's not even Hitchcock's best. Uh, people ripped that person apart and it was pretty nasty and I don't want to go there. I might agree somewhat, but um, I'm not going to go that far lest I get ripped apart too. The thing about Vertigo for me is that there are some parts that I just don't enjoy watching. They make me feel tense and uncomfortable, even a little queasy. Like. I get a stomach ache sometimes watching this movie, and I'm sure Hitchcock would smile and say, good, that's how I want you to feel. Eh, but it's not exactly a fun time, you know? I'm gonna explain more, but that takes us into the spoiler zone. So here's your warning, I'm about to reference uh, plot details and revelations, which some of you might not want to hear, so here's a timestamp in case you want to skip ahead to when it's safe again. Um, I will see you there. <laughs> okay? Okay. Vertigo definitely stands up to repeat viewings, thanks in part to the big twist, here it comes, where you find out that Madeline, the Madeline Scotty was following around San Francisco and fell in love with, was actually not his friend's wife, but another woman, Judy, pretending to be Madeline. Of course, the first time around, this makes you want to go back and rewatch the first half to reevaluate what you saw in light of new information. Judy's job was to make Scotty think Madeline was crazy and get him to witness her suicide, when in actuality she was murdered by her husband. They weren't supposed to fall in love, he wasn't supposed to go kinda nuts and keep looking for Madeline after she was dead, and he definitely wasn't supposed to find Judy. With such a relatively small cast, Vertigo still manages to boast three characters whose personal anguish I way over sympathize with. We already talked about Midge, I've kind of talked about Scotty, who I sympathize with to a point. Now, we've got to talk about Judy. 
Kim Novak does a fine job with dual performances. You really get the sense that Judy and Madeline are two completely different people, even though they aren't. It's not just the clothes and the hair. Madeline is neurotic, elegant but sensitive. Her voice is soft and breathy, a low tone with a posh accent. Judy is more down to earth, a city girl now who originally hails from Kansas. Experience has given her a touch of cynicism, but she's still warmer and more lively than the subdued, melancholy Madeline. Judy was an accomplice in a devious, premeditated murder plot, but I still feel for her. She had to push away the man she loved and convince him that she was dead with the assumption that she'd never see him again. Now, unexpectedly, he's back in her life and she's torn. She tries to push him away, but she can't resist giving in because she loves him and she wants him and she wants to be loved, even if it's under false pretenses. As for Scotty, he's so desperate to find Madeline again that it's not enough that Judy's facial structure bears an uncanny resemblance. He wants to give her a complete physical makeover and bring Madeline back from the dead so he can have her, which is disturbing. Judy protests the whole way, but she still agrees to this weird relationship because, like Midge, she wants to be with Scotty so much. Only the process of being molded back into Madeline's image is absolute torture for her. She wants his love and attention, and if she pretends to be Madeline for him, she'll get it. But she also wants to be loved for herself, not as another person. Something that we all want. But he barely even sees Judy. He essentially rejects her own appearance and personality. He doesn't really want Judy, he wants Madeline. Even though Madeline is Judy. Ugh, it's such twisted, painful psychology going on here. Vertigo has one of Hitchcock's most atmospheric, most gorgeously rendered love scenes, and I can hardly enjoy it because the whole time I'm consumed with these feelings of dread. Even the beautiful love theme is anxious. That is a slight exaggeration. The scene is great from every aspect, technical, aesthetic, thematic, and I'm able to appreciate that even with all the emotional turmoil swirling in my intestines. And it seems to be like that every time, by the way. I might catch the movie with only 20 or 25 minutes remaining and I still get all worked up inside. As for the ending, I don't know. I suppose there's a feeling of rightness about it. The symmetry is satisfying. Doubles and mirror images pervade through the whole movie, culminating in this finale. It tickles your mind, the nun appearing in the darkness is genuinely frightening, and the tragic irony packs a powerful punch. But I come away feeling like, well, I don't know if I'm satisfied or happy or what, because I don't know what I wanted to happen. I don't know if I wanted them to end up happily ever after, or if I wanted justice to be served. I, I have no idea. Anyway, there's definitely no other Hitchcock movie that makes me feel quite the same way as this one does. The suspense, the tension, there's just something about it that feels more personal, more intimate. I wouldn't say it's more effective than his other movies, but it's effective in a different way. I feel like I've given the impression that my feelings about this one are mixed. They're not. I like the movie. I just react strongly, and sometimes in a negative way, to things that happen on screen, and I think those are parts that are supposed to make you squirm, so... I'm doing exactly what Hitchcock wanted me to do. What's really great is that I feel like each time I watch it, I notice and appreciate something new. Which means that this is a movie that will never get old. Alright, those are my thoughts on Vertigo. I'm very curious to hear what my viewers have to say about this one. I know I have some viewers who consider this one a favorite, a favorite film, a favorite Hitchcock film. So go ahead and share your thoughts on this movie in the comments below if you like. I look forward to reading them, and I will see you again soon. Thanks for watching!